my name is Gabriella Citrin, and I am the Senior Events Manager at the Durst Organization. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Durst commercial tenants and residents, as well as Princeton Longevity Center guests. Before we begin, however, we'd like to go over some housekeeping. For those who may be unfamiliar to the webinar format, please note that unlike previous Durst events, you will only see the present presenters on the screen, not all participants. We encourage you to ask questions via the Q&A section. I would like to invite you to start sending those questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. Please feel free to continue to send questions throughout the webinar, and we will try to get to as many as possible after our presentation. Our silent moderator, Andrea Lanza, will be monitoring the chat function should you need any assistance with anything. To use the Q&A function, click on the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. Enter your question in the text box and hit send. If you see a question posted that you would also like to hear answered, please click the like button rather than resubmitting that question again. Tonight, the Durst Organization has partnered with One World Trade Center tenant Princeton Longevity Center to celebrate Heart Health Month and shine a light on the importance of a healthy heart. With their flagship office at One World Trade Center, Princeton Longevity's preventive medicine and executive health exam centers combine the latest technologies for early disease detection with the time, care, and attention that busy executives need in order to maximize health, productivity, and enjoyment of life. Tonight, I'm proud to introduce Manager of Exercise Physiology, Dr. Harry Pino, and Ellie Kamek, Registered Dietitian at PLC, who will take you through the ins and outs of getting the most from your workout, including a video tutorial of a 10-minute HIIT workout you can do at home, all in with pre- and post-workout nutrition suggestions for improved performance. It is my pleasure now to turn over the spotlight to Dr. Pino. Thank you, Gabby. Um, my name is um, Dr. Harry Pino. I'm the uh, Exercise Physiology Manager at Prince of Longevity Center. Uh, and the Exercise Physiologist here at um, One World Trade Center uh, location. Uh, I'm excited today to be presenting you um, information tonight about um, understanding the ways of training and your cardio workouts. So to start, um, we. This slide here, it's just going to present some basic information uh, uh, and the importance of training. So basically, the heart is a muscle, and there's many ways of keeping the heart healthy. But in this case, we would like uh, you to understand that there's two systems that we normally use is your aerobic system, um, which is um, the presence of oxygen um, during that physical activity and also um, the anaerobic system, which is um, um, there's still some oxygen, but it's the demand is not as great as, uh, as your aerobic. Um, so the heart rate is when the heart pumps. So it has a number. It's the number of times your heart beats uh, per minute. So in, in, in this function, it's also called the pulse. <clears throat> and um, during the, this pulse, we relate that information with intensities. So basically what's happening is when the heart pumps per minute, we look at how much it pumps. We also look at the information of the beats per minute, like I said. So normal heart rates vary from person to person. The resting heart rate is when uh, the heart is pumping at the lowest amount and the most efficient amount as possible throughout the body. In normal situations, we see heart rates between 60 and 70, sometimes 80 beats a minute and during rest periods. 
if you're well trained, it could be dropping below 60 in, in the 50s or even in the low 40s. And some professional athletes, that's where normally they, they run at. So like I mentioned, the, the, there's two types of exercise um, that really impacts your heart. It's the aerobic exercise, um, also known as cardio. Um, and, and, and the concept here is to increase your heart rate at a certain level or certain beats per minute. And your anaerobic exercise, which is the same concept in terms, it will increase your heart rate, but at higher intensities. And the duration of these activities at this range is very short. And that's one of the techniques of the now well-known program of, of HIT. So the training impact on the heart is, it's very simple. It's, uh, the heart will get stronger the more we demand intensity. So both the anaerobic and the aerobics programming or systems or exercises, they use different metabolic systems, meaning the aerobic will use mostly fats as the main fuel. Even that's why they tend, those sessions tend to be a little longer. And your anaerobic system tends to use more on the sugars, the carbs, um, 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 which is quick energy. So having said this, you have to understand and you have to have clear what is your goal with the exercise. It, it's, it's maybe it's weight management, maybe it's just weight control, or maybe you just want to get fitter, right? So basically you have to determine what, what, what goals you would, would like to achieve, right? And, and it's important to understand also that this is a great tool to use to monitor the actual intensity. If we know what heart rate is more efficient for you, therefore your workouts will be longer, will be smarter, and the most important aspect, it would be very, very safe. So keep in mind that when athletes are pretty fit, right? So when they stop exercising for one or two weeks due to an injury or due to um, other circumstances, um, their fitness will drop pretty fast, okay? So the fitter you are, the quicker it will diminish um, when you have an, uh, an, an, an injury. But in the opposite, if you're just um, apparently healthy but deconditioned and you're starting to exercise and you start these exercise at a certain heart rate range, you will notice that you, your improvement rapidly will, 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 will incline. Um, um, so you, you have to understand that it's, it's, it's very unique because when you're, when you're not fit, you get quicker, you get fitter quicker. But when you're fitter, you could lose that pretty much um, in several weeks. So um, keep that in mind. And these are the things that we look for. So we look then at the way you're training. We want you to train more efficiently throughout your exercises. And like I mentioned, if you're considering weight loss, then we could do um, uh, the programming based on weight loss in, in terms of intensity. So let's explain this concept of heart rate training zones. Um, um, heart rate training zones, it's, it's, typically, it's typically heart rate response. So your heart rate will respond to certain intensities. So through research, we have found out that we could break these zones in steps or in um, um, levels. Um, and the beautiful thing of this is we could use it on your own, on your own, with your own heart rate. So with your own heart rate max, which is, we'll get into this heart rate max in a couple of seconds here, but once we figure out where your heart rate max is, then we could really pinpoint how to divide this in percentages. So if you look at some of the scales, some of the scales will have a, a, a easy um, training, uh, 50, 60%, others will say 60, 70%, and so on. 
So heart rate training will help you not only work out easier, but also safer, like I said, right? But then we compare that with a, what we call the rate of perceived exertion. This is a suggestive measurement in how you feel in, throughout your exercise. We normally say, hey, one to 10, 10 being very difficult, one very easy, how you feel. And normally we use this when we're doing stress tests and or in cardiac rehab or in any other type of rehab that a heart rate is increased. And the beautiful thing of using this perceived assertion um, with the heart rate is that you don't need any wearables at all. It's just, again, it's just very subjective. And then it's your own feeling, how, how you feel throughout the exercise bout, okay? The reason I bring up the RPE is because a lot of our patients and clients and, 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 and some of the people listening to this, this um, information, you know, could be on heart medication. And keep in mind when you're in heart medication, your heart rate tends to stay on the lower side, especially if you're on beta blockers. So like I said a few seconds ago, you have the scale, which is a numerical aspect and two to four, it's very light. And this is how you rate your exercise. And that correlates around 50 to 60% of your heart rate. Um, if you go down the scale a seven to a five to seven, it's moderate intensity, right? So that's around 70, 80%. And so on. Seven to nine is hard, the hardest songs that you will find. And normally, this is where that hit technique spends most of its time um, um, working with, uh, 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 with your workloads, with your intensities. So keep this in mind because we're going to get back to that. So, this is an easier way of understanding or visualizing how the training zones work, right? So these are five zones. Again, you will see some scales that will have uh, some graphs will have three zones, others four, five. Sometimes I've seen up to six zones. So basically zone one, again, it's 50 to 60%. And this is the way you will act or the way you will respond to the clinician or the personal trainer or the EP, um, you know, how you feel. Oh, I could do this all day and, and so on. A three would be 70 to 80% aerobic capacity, um, meaning that's where your most aerobic um, workout will be around that section. And let me explain something about your aerobic capacity or your aerobic zone. Out of the two systems, the anaerobic and or the aerobic zone, keep in mind that your aerobic zone is the most modifiable um, of, of both zones. You could modify this even by looking at the scale, we could see you're still working at, at, at a good cardiovascular um, intensity at 50% all the way to 80, 90%. So you've got pretty big range here to work with, right? So explaining the heart rate zones now from a clinical standpoint, again, here we go. The, the RPE, it's a rate perceived absorption, it's six to 20. The one to 10 scale, it's the, um, the old school scale, right? And so these two scales represent practically the same, but you'll notice again, how modifiable it is. It's, it's very interesting. Um, uh, most of us would like to be working between a 12 and 14, 15 range even on a regular basis, okay? Most days of the week, this is the range where you should be working at. And if you're starting, don't worry about this zone. Go up a little a lo less intense, eight to 11, which is ideal. Okay. Same cardiovascular effect, but different in terms of duration will be a little uh, different, right? And then so on, all the way down to 17. Having said this, so now, we um, look at some of these benefits by training in these correct zones. The most important thing, like I said, is figuring out what, what is your goal? Weight management, get fitter, uh, run faster, and so on, right? Then we have to understand what 
both systems we're going to be using, either your aerobic system or your anaerobic system. Then after that, then we could start really figuring out the workloads or the different intensities. Now, having said this, there's many, many equations out there. The 220 minus your age, it's the one that most gyms will use. And if like, and if you look at the, at, at, if you really could understand this, when you get on a treadmill or any cardiovascular piece of equipment, you will notice that these numbers will be blinkings and it will say, enter your age, enter your, um, um, your weight and so on. So it's, it's actually calculating the 220 minus your age and then it will show you, oh, here's your fat burning zone or here's your conditioning zone. So if you look back at the graph before this one, it's practically the same thing. It's giving you percentages of where you should be or where you, or where you could concentrate most of your physical activity time at the gym. Now, having said this, the 220 minus your age is not that accurate um, because there's all the fitter you are, I stay away from the 220. I go into more um, maybe the 218, maybe a, a 208 like I have here. Um, it's pretty accurate. Um, um, and it's the one that uh, most of the time in clinical settings we use a lot in um, when we're, especially when we're doing stress tests. It's 208 minus a percentage times over your age. And then it, you follow this following steps, right? The same steps as, as, as the, um, um, once you get that percentage. So again, you have to figure out what intensity you wanna work out at. So, so then we could figure out what systems you're gonna use. I love to compare the RPE scale always with a heart rate. For a lot of folks that are just starting exercising, right? It's, it's important to understand, I would not worry so much about the higher intensities of workout because it's just gonna, it's gonna be too hard. And the goal is to come back the next day and the following day. A lot of mistakes that people do is they work out too hard. Their heart rate is too high. It feels good at, at that moment. However, the next day you're gonna pay the price. So I prefer lowering that intensity to 60, maybe 70% and following the guidelines of ACSM, obviously. But, so, but then you have a better chance of producing a good cardiovascular effect on that exercise, with the exercise. And then we go back and using the right, the, the, the right um, metabolic system. So it really doesn't matter if you run a mile or you walk a mile. Caloric expenditure is the key here. And by using heart rates, then we could really figure this out. So now that we have a basic understanding of heart rate training, now let's talk a little bit about the fun stuff, the HIT technique. HIT stands for high intensity interval training. There are several types of interval trainings, obviously there, the, um, the, you know, the, the, the old school uh, days, it used to be high intensity, long periods of time, 20, 30 consecutive minutes, then with moderate rest. And then we found out that it will increase your exercise post caloric expenditure. It burns more fat, that's true. Um, and it will keep burning some extra calories at the end. But we noticed that with this type of activity, we started to lose muscle mass, right? And I don't know about you, but I haven't seen a obese or, or a fat marathoner, right? They're all skinny. They, they're great from a cardiovascular standpoint, but their muscle mass is very diminished. So, so, so this is a good example. With the HIT technique, it tends, it pushes you in a higher level of aerobic capacity. It pushes you all the way to your anaerobic capacity. And remember what I said, it's a, not a whole lot of presence of oxygen, but the duration of that activity is short. The exercise portion is very short, maybe a full minute all out with one full minute of recovery. 
So, and, and you're using a, a little bit of, of, of both systems, but you have to understand that most of the systems that you will be using here is your a, um, anaerobic system, right? So, and by increasing that intensity, your heart rate stays high. Um, and the key here is that intensity should be no less than 80%. Again, um, if you're starting with this new concept of HIIT, HIIT training, I always recommend a lot of our patients or clients to start around breaking it up two sessions of, of, of 10 minutes for a total of 20 minutes or two 15 minute sessions with seven at 70 to 85 percent. Um, I would even drop that to 80 percent of intensity just so you could get used to this intensity three to four weeks at this pacing, at this intensity, then add another frequency, uh, another extra day in between. Then once your body's adaptable, then we could go into the actual hit technique. Obviously you can have some cool downs and warm ups in this, but working with the hit technique, the idea is to burn as much calories as you can with a short period of time. That's really the concept of hit. But again, you have to be fit to do this. If not, go back, it decrease the intensity, okay? Maybe increase the frequency of exercise and we're all set with that, okay? Now, uh, during a hit, we have found that some people will experience some, you know, breathing issues or even some weakness. So I strongly recommend stop exercising, try to cool down, a little bit and call your um, doctor immediately, definitely. So heart rate should be at least 70% um, of recovery before your next session. So let's say, for example, you have, you're working at 95% intensity for one minute, you can have one minute in terms of time to recover or if your heart rate drops up to uh, at 70% from that heart rate max that we mentioned at the beginning. Those are two good ways of, of, of looking at, at how to move to your next rotation. So this is very important because a lot of people don't, they just go by time and not the heart rate. I believe in heart rate training and I believe that heart rate recovery is a good indicator uh, not only fitness, but also is a good indicator of just staying safe in these parameters, okay? So maybe you have to work out a little less than the minute. Maybe you have to do 45 minutes, right? And then recovery half of that time, or maybe you have to drop the intensity to 70%. So if you look at what I'm trying, if, if you're trying, if, if, if you understand what I'm trying to say here is, Intensity is the key. It's not so much the frequency and the duration of the activity and spe specifically the hit technique. It's mostly the intensity, the workload. If you could handle these workloads, then your performance or your intervals then could be adaptable like I mentioned a few seconds ago. So try to hit around 80%. If not, then drop that down to 70%. This technique is known to improve and build a very solid aerobic base or aerobic power. It will definitely improve your anaerobic capacity. Therefore, it will improve your VO2 max, which is another topic. If, um, hopefully we could talk about this in the future about VO2. The VO2 stands for volume of oxygen you will receive more volume of oxygen at higher intensities. And, and, and that's really what VO2 is. And that's what really the HIT technique is. So having said this, so my final recommendation, okay, uh, is it's truly focus on your heart rate intensity, not so much at your pace. The biggest mistake people do is when they're working out with a, with a friend or, or a buddy, a, a workout buddy, um, it could be either running or 
exercising in the gym or so on is we always want to mimic what our friends are doing and we don't really consider how we're truly feeling if you could really focus on your heart rate zones you really could have a great outcome okay there are many cardiovascular benefits of training smart so remember to improve you have to move but you got to move the right way. You have to understand that heart rate training is the key. If you don't have a heart rate monitor, then use the Borg scale, use the RPE scale as an indicator of where you're at. Okay, so I would like to thank you for your time tonight and remind you to please continue to enter your questions into the Q&A functions. And at, at the end of the presentation, um, um, we will get to as many questions as possible, right? Now, um, it's my pleasure in introducing my colleague, um, um, uh, Ellie um, Kadesh. Uh, she's our regist uh, registered dietitian um, and who will discuss fueling and your workouts. And um, just before I leave, I really would like to thank um, um, Princeton Longevity Center um, 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 and um, Andrea Lanza for this opportunity. And also um, to thank um, the uh, Hearst organization for this opportunity. Thank you and Ellie, go get it. Hi everyone. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks Harry for the handoff. Um, I'm Ellie Kamek. I'm the, the registered dietitian at Princeton Longevity Center's Bone World Trade Center location. Um, and it's my pleasure to be presenting on fueling your cardio workout today. Um, so just kind of talking about the nutrition side um, of what Harry was speaking on. Um, so we're gonna advance this slide. All right, so how nutrition impacts our performance um, Sorry, I jumped ahead a bit there. <laughs> so instead of using our banned substances or um, potentially harmful, unnecessary restrictions or um, aids and supplements, we want to try to use nutrition first uh, as it's a practical and safe, effective way um, to really elevate our uh, athletic skills. Um, it's also going to be safe because all of our energy needs and metabolic demand varies from person to person. Uh, because of our type of exercise, the length of exercise that we're doing, whether it's strength-based or endurance exercise or exercise goals or our current strength state. Um, so everything's going to um, kind of change that when it comes to an exercise standpoint. Your biology is also going to change your uh, metabolic needs as well. Um, things such as your age, your sex, any chronic conditions that you may be dealing with, um, those are all going to factor uh, your nutrition needs as well. Um, and each nutri nutrient itself is also going to play a specific and very different role in supporting your training and competition and your cardiovascular health. Um, so that's why it's so important to have an investigative nutritional game plan um, to navigate the need or not for supplements and other aids uh, beyond what we're consuming from our food. Um, so I kind of broke down strength-based versus endurance-based exercise and broke it down to three different windows. Um, this is a very generic ranges for grams and timing for each carbs and protein. Um, so this is going to just be based off of the 2000 calorie diet. So obviously, um, if you're following a little bit less than that for your caloric intake or more than that, your needs are going to change a little bit and a registered dietitian can help you um, kind of tweak your needs a little bit and get a little bit more specific here. Um, so for carbohydrates first, um, this is for strength-based workout only. We'll do endurance next. Um, for pre-workout, we're going to be focusing on carbs and not protein. Um, so we want about 30 to 60 grams, 30 to 60 minutes before our exercise, which is pretty easy um, to memorize, 30, 60, 30, 60. Um, for fueling ourselves during our workout, um, if it's less than 45 minutes for a strength-based exercise, we don't need to worry about really fueling. We want to focus on hydrating through water. Um, but if it's more than 45 minutes, we want to focus on small sips or bites. Um, so later on, when I talk about um, protein bars, I'll show you uh, these great carb little uh, blocks. They're from Cliff and Gatorade makes these as well. Um, they're great little carb bites. Um, and then you can also do like Gatorade or another sports drink every couple 15 to 20 minutes for a strength-based workout. Um, when it comes to post-workout, this is when protein comes into play. It's going to be a four to one ratio with carbs and carbs is going to be about 40 grams per kilogram of body weight. 
um, or 40 grams of per kilogram, sorry, just 40 grams total. And this is going to change per your body weight, depending on your body weight and your caloric intake. Um, and then protein, we want to do it in a four to one ratio with carbs in about an hour after you work out. Um, another way you can do is the 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight per your whole day. Um, and then we want to make sure we're getting a lot of that in an hour after our workout. Um, so that's a little bit more specific based on body weight. So I promised I would go into endurance exercises. Well, the windows and the amounts of each nutrient vary a little bit when it comes to endurance exercise. Um, but carbs are going to be basically the same across the board for pre-workout. It's always going to be about 30 to 60 grams of carbs 30 to 60 minutes before. Um, so that's a really easy one to remember no matter what type of exercise you're doing. Um, during workout, you're actually going to want to fuel if you're doing endurance workout. And it's 30 to 60 grams, again, with carbs, no protein. Um, and it's about every hour during your endurance exercise. Um, so you can time it that way. For post-workout, it's going to be the four to one ratio again. Um, however, the total is going to be about 80 grams within the hour afterwards. Or you can do 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of your body weight if you want to make it a little bit more specific um, to yourself. And I know most of you are probably like, I don't know how many kilograms I weigh. <laughs> um, so you can easy way to do that is take your weight in pounds and just divide it by 2.2 and that's how many kilograms you weigh. And we just kind of do it in kilograms because we're talking in grams to keep it on the metric system. So that is for those two different types of workouts and the fueling windows for those. And I want to talk about omega-3s because they're very important for our heart health. However, they're also important for our performance health. So kind of breaking down what omega-3s are first. Um, so hence the name omega-3. There's three different types. And we convert it in this pathway. It goes from ALA to EPA to DHA. And yeah, those words are quite big. So we're just going to stick with the abbreviations instead of butchering the words. Uh, and unfortunately, ALA is our plant source protein. So this is where vegans and vegetarians who are going to be consuming a lot of fish, this is where they're going to get a lot of our, their omega-3s from. Uh, but the sad thing is, is that we're not actually very efficient in converting this into the uh, useful EPA and DHA. Those are what we utilize for the anti-inflammatory um, and various other functions of omega-3. Uh, we only convert about 0 to 9% of it. Um, and specifically, 8 to 20% of it, we convert into EPA, and then we convert about a half to 9% into DHA. So we really, by the time we get to DHA, we're not really converting a lot of it from the, AL, the original ALA. Um, so that's why we want to, if we can, um, focus on focusing on consuming EPA and DHA, um, which is going to be our fatty fish and shellfish uh, sources. So salmon, shrimp, mussels, tuna, um, and so forth. EPA is going to have a cardiovascular function. Uh, it's also going to participate in our joint health, our neurological health, our vision, and metabol uh, metabolic health as well. Um, DHA is going to contribute to all those things as well. However, it does have an added bonus of being a structural, uh, structural function. So it's a component of our cell membranes and also the gray matter in our brain. Um, and vision as well. So it's, it's adding all that anti-inflammatory properties from the heart health to our brain health to our joints, uh, our vision, but it's also a huge proponent of our component of our cell structure in all those areas. Um, so getting a little bit more into specifics about the function of omega-3, um, we have cardiovascular benefits. So first, lipid panel management. And um, Dr. Carlsberg talked about a little bit more about this a week ago, but briefly from a nutrition standpoint, our lipid panel management, omega-3s are going to help us decrease our triglycerides, and they're going to help us increase our HDLs, um, which a good way to remember HDLs, knowing which ones those are. Those are our good lipids. They're our hero lipids, so the H hero. Um, they help uh, take out the lipids from our blood and bring them back to the liver so that we can metabolize them and get rid of them. They're heroes. They're happy. They help us. Um, the LDLs are the ones we want to keep very low. Those are our loser LDLs. Uh, so you can think about it that way. And omega-3 helps us keep more of the hero ones, uh, our levels up in our blood. And it also helps with plaque management. Uh, studies have shown that omega-3 can reduce and positively remold or remodel, I'm sorry, our plaque formation um, high levels of omega-3, so high levels of DHA and EPA, uh, were also associated with less plaque progression. Um, and they can decrease some of those cells within the plaque that further progress it. And again, Dr. Carlsberg went way into depth about the plaque buildup and uh, how that 
you know, contributes to cardiovascular health. So in consuming omega-3s is going to help regulate our plaque buildup and the progression of that um, from a cardiovascular standpoint. From a performance standpoint, it's going to contribute to recovery and performance um, and muscle health as well. Um, from a recovery standpoint, uh, omega-3s are going to help decrease our inflammation and decrease our oxidative stress. Um, omega-3s just lessen the oxidative damage to the muscle. Um, from a performance standpoint, it's going to increase our endurance, it's going to increase our reaction times, and it's going to increase our strength and power and doing so, uh, decreasing our perceived exertion. So Harry was speaking on this before, it's kind of decreasing um, how we perceive that we're like exerting ourselves. So that allows us to in improve our endurance and work out a little bit longer. And it does so um, by decreasing our heart rate and decreasing the amount of oxygen burned by the body. Um, so that means that we need a little bit less energy to perform that endurance exercise so we can push ourselves so that extra mile um, or extra couple of minutes. So it's also going to be beneficial for muscle health. Um, so it's going to increase our muscle building response. When we exercise, we release insulin and amino acids. Um, and omega threes increases our building uh, muscle building response to that insulin and amino acids, um, so we build our muscles faster and more efficiently. Um, again, omega three, like I mentioned before, is also anti-inflammatory by nature, um, so it's going to decrease the onset of muscle soreness, but it's also going to increase the structural integrity of the muscle cell membranes, um, and that which is just going to promote recovery further by decreasing the muscle damage from exercise. Um, if we want to supplement omega-3, and I'm going to go more into supplements at the end of this uh, presentation, um, but while we're on the subject of omega-3s, we want to supplement between 1,000 and 4,000 milligrams daily. I mean, your cardiologist uh, could have a more specific uh, dosage for you, and we want to make sure we're picking a supplement that's omega-3 concentrated. Um, the really sad thing is in this country that our supplement industry is not regulated uh, by the FDA, so there's a lot of um, omega-3 supplements out there that advertise themselves as omega-3, um, but they're omega-6 concentrated. There's more omega-6, there's over 50% omega-6 and less than 50% omega-3. So you're, you're taking a pill and not getting what you're taking it for. Um, and we get plenty of omega-6 from our diet and the only reason why you're taking the pill is for omega-3 anyways. Um, so you wanna just check that back and make sure it's more concentrated in omega-3, if anything, only omega-3. Um, you can look for fish oil pills, um, they're going to be the most absorbable. You can look for algae. They're going to be uh, vegan and vegetarian friendly. They're just not going to be as absorbable. Um, the ethyl ester form as well is not very absorbable, but it's very common on the market. So stick to the fish oil uh, end of it. Uh, krill oil is also another very popular one. Um, and while it's very highly absorbable, you have to take a large dosage to get the amount of omega-3 that you need. Um, so it's just better to go with straight up fish oil if you can. So next, uh, a protein bar or carb bar in disguise. And I, I love this because, again, the FDA regulates our food, um, but if the company does not put the word high in front of their protein bar, they can claim it's a protein bar. And you're kind of tricked into eating this bar and you're thinking, oh, this is my protein source after my workout. And you're really just eating a carb bar and it's not actually high in protein. Um, so here are some tools uh, for you. So you just look at the back of your label. Um, you don't even have to look at the percentage of daily value that's based off of a 2000 calorie diet. Um, just go right for the grams. If it's over 10 grams, that's going to be a protein bar. And that's something you can utilize after your workout or for a snack, if you didn't get enough protein during your meal for that day. Uh, so just look for the protein, make sure it's over 10 grams of protein. These are four brands. Um, obviously there's many, many more, but these are kind of like top four. My favorite uh, is perfect bar. I recommend them to every one of our patients. And they have a lot of protein. They have anywhere from 15 to 18 grams of protein per bar. Um, we also want to look at the carb content of it and make sure it's moderate to low carbohydrates. That's really just staying below 54, but kind of staying in the teens to the 30s would be ideal. Um, so this is what you need to look for if you're really consuming a protein bar. Um, here is what a carb bar is. And I know you guys probably see clips at the bottom. And many people, maybe like myself, grew up thinking Cliff Bars were protein bars. Um, the Cliff Protein on the other side is the protein bar. But the traditional Cliff Bar is going to be more of a carb bar, which is great for energy purposes, not for muscle building purposes. Um, these are going to be over 55 grams of carbs, and they're going to have less than 10 grams of protein. And I mentioned earlier when you're we talking about the windows, um, to look for those little chews. You can see them on the right side here. Those are the Cliff Blocks. 
Um, Cliff makes them, Gatorade makes them, Powerade probably makes them. They're about square size and they're little chewables. So it gives you a little bit of carb intake uh, to do during your workout every 15 minutes or every hour, depending on the type of exercise you're doing. So this is how you can tell the difference. If you're like, what bar do I eat? Um, protein bars can be more than 10 grams and uh, in the 30s would be ideal for carbs, but less than 55. A carb bar is going to be for energy, not for muscle building. Um, and that's going to be over 55 grams of protein and probably less than 10 grams of protein. So beat the marketing industry. <laughs> uh, another big uh, fool with uh, nutrition is supplements. When do we take supplements? Do we take them? Do we not take them? Um, my rule of thumb is take them if you are trying everything you can first from your food, like you can see in the pyramid on the right. We have an abandoned food pyramid that is a thing of the past, but we use it for priority. So this is um, supplement nutrition priority a pyramid. Food first, then like sports drinks or liquid nutrition in a second, you know, um, powders and aids like that are coming from food, but just not in the food form. And then supplemental pills at the last case scenario. So I like to say to my patients, um, try to get 25% of all your uh, different um, amino acids, your vitamins, your minerals, anything, or your protein um, from food first. And then if we can't get that last 25%, we can supplement if need be. Um, so these are common sports nutrition supplements. We have uh, creatinine, which is going to be um, enhancing muscle repair and efficiency, and as well, as well as muscle strength. And fishes, poultry, meat, they're all going to be sources of, of creatinine. So if you have those in your diet regularly, you don't need to be supplementing creatinine. Um, beta alanine is a precursor to carnosine, and it buffers our muscle acid to enhance our endurance. So it kind of allows us to uh, not produce as much acid, and we have that decreased perceived exertion, so we can kind of push ourselves further. Uh, that's what beta alanine is going to do for us. And it's the same thing with meat, fish, and poultry. If we're eating enough of it, we don't need to be getting it from food. Um, our performance isn't going to be impacted at all because we're getting all that we need from food first. Um, L-arginine and nitric oxide. Um, L-arginine has a performance and recovery, so uh, there, it does both. Um, it improves our stamina and enhances our anaerobic recovery. Um, so that's both a performance and a recovery supplement. This one is definitely something to really wait on supplementing because no matter if you're a carnivore or a vegetarian, there's so many foods that provide L-arginine and nitric oxide, like not just meats and dairy, um, you're gonna find it in nuts, beets are really common for the nitric oxide, soy, whole greens, dark green leafy vegetables, I joke, are like the answer to everything with nutrition, um, and even some dark chocolate um, is gonna provide you with these guys. So you can see it's a really wide variety of foods. Um, so the likelihood of you needing to supplement L-arginine or nitric oxides is quite low. Let's move to the next one. There we go. Um, so I was talking about having to supplement and like, when do we know that we need to supplement? Um, there's a few ways that you can kind of check to see if the supplement is right for you. Apologize. Um, three things, scientific research, certifications and ingredients. So ingredients, check the back. If the ingredients are listed individually, um, chances are it's a good and safe quality product. There's what's their listing is actually going to be in there. It's when they start using the word blends and you see the ingredients not listed by themselves, that's when you're probably not actually getting what they're saying is in the supplement. Um, it's horrible, right? It's crazy that we can do this. Uh, someone can make a supplement and say something's in it, but that's not true. Um, certifications are another way that you can see if your supplement uh, is at quality standards and is what's in it is in it. Um, these certifications are third party. So these supplement companies have to go to another company, pay for the certification and update it um, every so years, depending on the certification. Um, so common certifications are NSF. Um, NSF for sport regulates uh, different sports and the band allowance of certain substances uh, in your body, whether they're natural or uh, an aid. Um, so it allows for you to be tested on a professional level and be cleared for to participate in your uh, sport. Um, and then GMP is another one. Another one that's not listed here is TSA. And that's actually one of my favorite ones because it's from Australia. And Australia has one of the strictest supplement uh, regulations. So if a company in the United States is getting that Australian certification, you know it's awesome. Um, scientific research as well. If they're constantly pushing the level and innovating every one of their products and constantly advancing it um, and not just leaving it the same for 20 years, um, that's also another indicator that it's safe and high quality. 
So these are four of my favorite uh, companies. I would recommend every one of these to all my patients. And I make sure that when I recommend any supplement beyond food first, um, it's going to be safe. I don't want to recommend anything that's going to be harmful um, to our patients. So Thorne is my favorite. Um, you'll hear about me if you meet me in person that I talk about Thorne nonstop. Uh, they're a New York City based company. So that's another reason why I like them. They're local. Um, and they are very, very heavy in science-based research. They're always pushing the level and constantly adding uh, products and changing their products and uh, posting research on their products and participating in outside research. They're just, they're incredible. Um, Solgar, if a store doesn't have a product that I'm looking for, I go to Solgar and Pure Encapsulations and Douglas Laboratories. Uh, all four of these, if you're looking for a supplement, you're looking to switch up your multivitamin or anything that you're taking, check these guys out. Um, I approve of every one of them. They have plenty of certifications and they're pushing the, uh, the, they're pushing the level with scientific research. So um, you can trust every single one of these. And we are going to work out now. So you can see the video that Harry and I filmed for you guys is a hit workout. So you can follow this at home with uh, Harry's custom hit for you guys. And we're going to play it right now. Right. So today's workout is going to be high intensity uh, interval training. It consists of a 30 second warm up for the following exercises. High knees. If you feel like you're a little more advanced then you could do some skipping high knees. The following immediately after it's a full jumping jacks. You could do modified as Ellie on my right and or a full jumping jack. Immediately after, we're going to go into steam engines. Make sure to lift those knees across your body as high as possible. Non-stop. The following would be a squat. You could go as fast as you can and or as slow just for control. Keep the core engaged. So the workout's gonna be 45 seconds um, for each exercise with a 15 second recovery. First exercise will be burpees. Now, this is the basically the basic burpees. You could jump at the end once you get to the top or you could just extend your body, bring the knees up. So then you get a 15 second break and then immediately into push-ups. You could do modified push-ups and or a full push-ups. Immediately after that, 15 second break, then you go in straight to the front lounges. Keep the body engaged and the core engaged moving forward. After this 15 second break, then you immediately get into the pikes push-ups. Remember, control the hips, keep them as high as possible. Immediately after that, you'll have a 15 second break. And we get into mountain climbers. You could go as fast as you can, or you could modify them. Remember, control the pace. Following that would be a 15 second break and then we go into Russian twist. Modified with the knees bent and or the knees totally extended. Immediately after that a 15 second break and we go into low to high planks. Again, control the pace. Following that you have a 15 second break and immediately we get into side planks. Okay, bring the hips as high as possible and drop them and then we change sides. And remember, it's all about intensity, you control the intensity. Thank you for that and for that great video. I'm sweating just watching it and thinking of how active I should actually be. Um, thank you, Ellie, Dr. Pino. What great, what a great presentation. Um, we obviously all learned quite a bit, and I can't wait to get that work up, a workout, excuse me, off of your YouTube channel. So we did have quite a few questions come through. Hoping you guys can stick around and, and a few more minutes and we'll get to some of those questions. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. 
So Ellie, we'll start with you. Um, instead, there's a question that came through. Instead of a bar or product with labels, can you recommend good natural foods for pre and post running workouts? Yeah, I'm running specifically, I mean, it really, it's not even dependent. It, both is going to be 30 to 60 grams of carbs per uh, beforehand. So we're going to focus on, you know, maybe low fat dairy, yogurt, and some nuts and seeds as granola. So it's going to fill you with some fiber um, and some carbs. You're going to get some protein there too. Um, it's not that we don't have any protein before. It's just that we're focusing on a fiber rich carbs. So um, maybe some low fat Greek yogurt, uh, berries and granola on top. Um, that's gonna be great if we're having right before you're not gonna feel too full um and then post workouts we're gonna focus on both um so you know maybe some eggs some animal protein you can do edamame uh, you can also have some fruit some uh, pretzels even even though that's not totally whole grain but that's okay as well um more of a fruit it depends on when you're exercising in the day do you want to make it more of a meal afterwards um then you're going to go for a larger uh four ounce maybe five portion of animal protein, you're going to do the vegetables to um, go for some healthy fats as well. If it's just a snack afterwards, um, a cheese stick, that's going to give you some low, uh, some protein as well as some low fat carbs. Um, edamame is a great snack afterwards for protein. Now there's tons of protein, about 13 grams per half a cup. So edamame is a great source of protein for more of a snack afterwards. Um, so it's really depending on how how, what time of the day are you want a meal or you want a snack? Um, so just adding that protein, but keeping that fiber rich carb at the end. Um, those are all some good options. Okay. Okay. There's a, there's one more question for you. Um, what is your opinion of the long-term effects of a keto type or LCHF diet? I can only assume that's low carb, high fiber, but obviously <laughs> you're the, you're the professional. So tell us what that is. And the um, so with the keto, you know, we have, we have a love hate affair with uh, specific diets. You know, I'm always going to preach first um, a mindful diet and trying to just be more in tune with your, your eating, hitting your macro needs um, and focusing on that and really being in tune with how your, what your gut is telling you, your gut is really your second brain. Um, if you are following a specific diet, I'd rather make that work for you instead of telling you to get off it and restrict it. Um, you're not going to sustain that as well if I'm just dictating to you. Um, so if you really want to follow keto, um, I'd rather make it work for you. Um, it's about once you're, you know, if you're following a very strict keto diet in the beginning for weight loss, uh, we want to be modifying it slowly back to regular um, or just consistently following it modified, um, not very strict long-term. I don't think a strict keto long-term would be very beneficial. Um, you're probably going to fluctuate your weight very quickly. Uh, your body composition might be thrown off as well. It's quite hard to sustain a very strict keto diet in the long term, especially if it's just for weight loss. Um, if you have some type of neurological condition like seizures or um, just epilepsy, um, then a strict keto diet, I am a proponent of that for long term. Um, but if that is not the cause, I'd rather you follow a modified keto diet um, for a long term. So kind of adjusting that bringing carbs back into your diet a little bit, not being so low um, and so drastic with the cutting the carbs. We want to be more at 30 if we're doing modified keto long-term, 30% uh, of your calories, I'm sorry. 30% uh, of your calories coming from carb if we're doing modified keto long-term. Um, but that's really the only time, I would never recommend strict keto over a long period of time unless it's for an actual chronic medical condition. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Pino, I believe this one is for you, but really, Maybe both of you. Um, how do inserted stents affect what is being discussed this evening? Wow, uh, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. Well, um, if your medical history or um, if, if your met cardiovascular history, um, 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 it really depends on medication. This is a Dr. K question, but I, I could answer it um, in, 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 with my limitation of, of, of cardiology, right? But, but if you have stents and you, you will be either on Crestor, like cholesterol medication and or a blood thinner for a year or so, um, after several months after having the stents, it, um, I know that when research shows that you could exercise, um, you could start around 50, 60% of intensity. Um, it, it also depends on your past history with uh, fitness, with exercise. But um, 
I personally don't see any issues um, um, exercising uh, at the right intensity um, um, with stents at all. Great. So there seems to be quite a few questions um, from people 60 plus uh, about their exercise and how do they know if they're overdoing it? How do they know if they're getting enough exercise? So can you talk a little bit um, ab about what, um, how do they know if they're overdoing it? That, that's a great question. Well, first of all, um, um, it, it really, like I said a few minutes ago, intensity is what's going to determine if you're going to keep exercising or not, right? If you're 60 and you have a strong history of exercising prior to your 60s, intensity, you could maintain it. Actually, research is showing that um, and again, track and field. Um, um, if you're a runner, they actually encourage you to do two times a week, not consecutive days of high interval workouts, 400s, 600, 800 meter repeats. It doesn't matter the age, you obviously you're gonna be a little slower, but the impact is the VO2. The, your oxygen intake will diminish per year, but if you train the body, the actual heart, to maintain those high intensities, your performance based on age group will not change much. So keep that in mind. So it's okay to train hard um, um, at, at that age. You just got to figure out if your body could handle the track workouts. Maybe not track workouts, but maybe you could do some longer intervals on the road or um, more straightaways or fartlets. Um, so it really depends on, it's really about sports specificity. Mm -hmm. And I'm using running as an example, because I love running. Um, but, but with runners at any age, we just incorporate more tempo runs, um, and they're high intensity still. So to answer the question now directly, it, it really depends on your fitness. Uh, if you work out one day and the next day you're not recovered well, you could tell your heart rate at rest is gonna be higher. Your, um, um, your sleeping habits, um, your eating habits, you gotta look at many factors that is it's, it's, it's contributing of not really recovering. So it's not just the actual training, but the training, it's just one spoke of the full umbrella. You, you have to look at nutrition. You have to look at your heart rate. You have to look um, your recovery. What are you doing for recovery? Because a lot of people in their 50s plus, 60 plus, it's all about recovery. Maybe you have to cut down an extra day of training for in a full day of recovery, meaning active recovery one day, and then the second day full rest. Then you go back to your quality workouts. Research is really showing this now, especially research in cardiovascular endurance athletes. Um, it's really showing that if you could really recover well, including nutrition, they could, they could be really perform at, at outstanding times. You just got to look at the, at the times right now in these group age group, 60 year olds. I mean, for heaven's sake, they're, they're dropping sub threes for marathons still. So. Yeah. Um, thank you for that answer. We're actually running out of time. Um, there's, there's quite a few more questions and, and interesting ones at that. So I do want to say that um, all the questions will be answered in the next week on Prince and Longevity's blog which is, will be located at um, princeandlongevitycenter.com slash news. We can add it um, in the chat and the follow-up email. Thank you, email. But I, I do want to say thank you to Dr. Pino and Ellie and everybody else for attending. We hope you found tonight's discussion informative. Um, if you'd like further information on PLC, please visit their website at www.princeandlongevitycenter.com or you can email them directly at webinar at princetonlongevity.info and there you see it on the screen. And of course, remember to look for the recording of this webinar and the 10 minute hit workout video on Princeton Longevity's YouTube channel. 
which is youtube.com slash Princeton Longevity. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Pino and Ellie. And we hope you all have a great evening and a healthy, uh, healthy month and healthy year. Yes. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.